You're listening to the Functional Nurse Podcast. On today's episode, we will talk about how to evaluate the evidence. So stay tuned. Hello, nurses, and welcome to this episode of the Functional Nurse Podcast. I am your host, Bridget Sager. I'm a family nurse practitioner. I own a functional medicine consulting practice, and I teach functional medicine to RNs and NPs through the Integrative Nurse Coach Academy in partnership with the Institute for Functional Medicine. In our last episode, I discussed whether functional medicine is evidence-based. So if you haven't heard that episode yet, I would suggest you go there first. Today, I want to talk about a topic that is important in functional medicine, how to evaluate the evidence and current research to determine what is best practice when you're approaching a patient or client from a functional medicine perspective. Earlier this year, I got a couple requests in a row that I, I thought were kind of amusing, but only, you know, if you know functional medicine, then it's funny, but otherwise it's not that funny. But um, I was asked, I was going to be speaking to a group and they asked me for a research article proving functional medicine is evidence-based to provide to the uh, attendees prior to the actual presentation and i like was racking my brain of like how to reply and you know there's there's not going to be one article as you you know if you don't already know this you'll learn in this episode today there's not going to be one article that like proves functional medicine works um the analogy that i used in my reply is that if you ask somebody to give a evidence-based article that proves that gynecology works, right? Like you're not going to get one article that proves that like obstetrics and gynecology is effective for for patients. But what you can do is look up the outcomes of pap screenings and mammograms and like it, it met the myriad of interventions that a gynecologist would uh, use in their practice of gynecology, right? So in functional medicine, we have lots of things that you can search for in the literature and find evidence that there is effective interventions that we can use in functional medicine and they are evidence-based. I mentioned last time that, you know, biochemistry and pathophysiology are the foundation of most of what we do in functional medicine. So you'll have to go back to your textbooks from school to look for most of what functional medicine is about. Um, but when we are looking for research articles that are proving that current methods are effective, we have to approach research from a different lens than maybe we have in the past. My belief is that functional medicine is healthcare finally acknowledging that biochemistry and pathophysiology, the nutrient demands of the body, and it helps people truly heal by identifying the disruptions in this process. The truth is a functional medicine is the epitome of evidence-based practice. It is the science of biochemistry and it acknowledges the demands of our body at the cellular level. It explores things in our health history and our lifestyles and our environments that can disrupt the normal processes in our body. As I mentioned in the last episode, students will ask me for a study to validate functional medicine practice. And that often does lead us back to our textbooks. Of course, there are also studies validating the individual functional medicine interventions and these studies are probably not going to be as big as a large clinical trial funded by a drug company, because who's going to pay for that? Unfortunately, healing people doesn't make our current healthcare industry money. So there isn't a huge incentive to study healing people. Imagine if we helped everyone that currently takes a prescription medication or five or 10 to heal. A lot of companies would go out of business. Obviously, this podcast episode is not going to replace the training that you would get in a university program. I'm currently working on my post-master's doctorate 
as a nurse practitioner and I am researching uh, ways to reduce proton pump inhibitor use long term because I am just so bothered by the amount of long term potential effects that it can have on our health and the downstream effects that are just rampant. So I am doing a ton of research. I have learned uh, how to do effective research for many years through my studies. And now I am very deep in it in, in my current uh, project uh, that is going on for at least the next year. So I feel like I can speak to this with some authority. And I wanted to start by talking about uh, what is a study and what are the types, just a little bit of an overview. There are the massive clinical trials that uh, are often ones that end up making a certain drug the proven best thing for an intervention. So th those are really large trials, lots of participants, often in the thousands. And then we can go all the way down to the single case study. And there is a spectrum between those two of a number of participants and number of uh, groups that they are studying and if there's a control group or not. Um, in the middle of this is cohort studies and functional medicine. You'll often see case studies where we've used functional medicine on a single person and written a case study on their outcomes. But we also find that there are a lot of cohort studies where you say, when we take this group of people with a common underlying root cause and we address X, Y, Z for them, do they get better? So those are co cohort studies that can validate functional medicine practices. That is often what we see in holistic research is cohort studies where we group people and follow them or look back on them later um, and evaluate their outcomes after an intervention. What functional medicine can't be valid, so functional medicine can't be validated by these 10,000 participant studies because when we look at the root cause of each individual person in that study, each person may have a different root cause. And so one intervention is not going to be proven effective for all of those participants. My favorite example you may know by now is hypertension. If we say people with sleep apnea who have hypertension, do they have an improvement in their blood pressure? Yes, we can do a study and prove that. But if we say, does treating sleep apnea, does somebody, does, do, do, can 10,000 people put on a CPAP and have their hypertension or blood pressure numbers improve? That isn't an effective measure because their cause of their hypertension could be any number of things. So we need to have smaller studies to validate functional medicine practices, but we're getting closer and closer to being able to group people into uh, the right cohorts, so to speak. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about genetics in a little bit. When we uh, have literature reviews and meta-analyses, these are where a researcher is taking the available research and creating a document for you to review where they kind of evaluate all the studies, they they tell you what they had in common, what the differences were, and what the findings were. And this may prove or disprove theories in a collection of common studies. An easy place to find and evaluate research is PubMed, and it's a free resource of organized healthcare research compiled by the National Library of Medicine. The National Library of Medicine has been compiling healthcare research on paper for uh, since 1879, so a long time. And it, as the internet became available, they started to share that online using the website PubMed. PubMed is a feature that we use in my course a lot. My students use this feature and um, it is easy to use. I, I, I feel like it's pretty easy to use. Um, and so it, I think it's intimidating for people that don't look up research frequently, but it's a lot like Google. You go in and you type something into the search bar. So you choose your keywords, you search, 
and then you can um, adjust your search settings with uh, filters. And I like to use the filters to weed out older studies most of the time. So I generally search within the last five years of research because there is constantly research emerging that discredits even things that we have found to be effective in the past. We have the latest, greatest all the time. So I uh, like to encourage people that have a passion topic to set up alerts. You can uh, create alerts so that you know when new research is released. And um, at the minimum, PubMed is going to give you a abstract or a summary of an article. But some articles are available to completely view only under a paid fee. And this is rarely offered by the actual author of the paper. So if you're like me and you're in school, you can often put in where your university's library has paid for access to PubMed's articles. So you can log in through your university and then you can often access research articles. So even when I can't get something for free, I'm able to open it anyway because of my university's access. So that's one way to get articles that are not free. You can search the name, copy and paste it in, and maybe somebody has made it available online for you to access. Um, but the third way is that the actual author is generally very happy to share it with you. So if there's any options for sending an email to the author of the actual study, not the journal it's published in, you can often have them very excited to share their uh, PDF version of their article with you via email. So some students in my course will do a search and find that they don't get a lot of information back on the topic they're looking up. And so we have to talk about choosing the right keywords when you're searching. It is um, challenging if you put in really specific terms right away on PubMed. So I encourage students to think broadly initially. So we're looking for non-pharmacological interventions for a condition. So you type in the name of the condition say you type in psoriasis and non-pharmacological, that term might not be in any articles. And so you, you can try that term, you can try holistic, you can type in things that we do in functional medicine in a broad way and see what comes back. So you might type in psoriasis and nutrition, psoriasis and food, um, exercise might be a term that you use. And so we have to get a little bit creative when we're trying to find articles to make sure we use the right words to bring back in our results what we're looking for. And so that is one tip that I have for you is if you're using PubMed and you're trying to find articles that are offering you information on a topic you're interested in, try changing up your search words to either be more broad or more concise, depending on the type of results you get from your first search. So you may need to narrow it down a lot if you get back a lot of information. One way to limit this that I think is really important, as I mentioned a bit earlier, is to be sure that you limit your research to the last five years. You can broaden that later if you're not getting a lot of information, but I find that a lot of research has gone down in the last five years that we can use to validate our current practice. There are, of course, studies that stand the test of time that have been used to build on over time. And this type of research is uh, appropriate to use long term. It often is the type of research that has been cited hundreds of times in literature and uh, provides a good foundation. But in general, we want to use more current research when we are looking at these smaller studies. Um, some of the education that I've gotten in functional medicine has offered much older research as evidence for practice or it may um you may have somebody tell you oh here's proof of this and you act, look at the link and it is a study done on mice or primates or something that doesn't apply to humans directly and so i think it's really important to get current research and to look at the research closely so i want to talk now about how to approach the article that you have found in your search the first thing that i do is i look at the title and then I read the abstract. 
at that point, you ask yourself, does this appeal to you? And is it what you're trying to learn more about? If no, move on, because there's plenty to read on PubMed. Uh, if yes, then the next thing that I do is skip down to the conclusion or the discussion. It could have either name at the end and read that. Are you still interested after what they mention in that area? If so, ask yourself who did the research? Who do they work for? Do they have any conflicts of interest? Sometimes they mention that. Is it a clinical trial? And if so, who funded it? Did a drug company prove that their drug works best? Read the rest from the beginning. So you start with the introduction, and I find that the first and last paragraphs of this section can be really insightful. Um, it helps you understand the author's intentions in performing the study. Look at the size of the study. Smaller studies are useful, but keep these numbers in mind. Pay particular attention to their methods and their participants. Were all the participants male or female or only children or only healthy individuals? or only people with a certain diagnosis that doesn't apply to what you're looking for? Are they only from one small island in the South Pacific? Because trust me, that happens more often than you would think. Truly question their methods. So look at the methods section and ask yourself, did they talk about and understand the biochemistry behind the problem that they are trying to address? This is really common that you find when you read their methods that there isn't a really solid foundation of what the mechanisms are behind the problem. And in functional medicine, we really care about that. Is it a study looking for evidence that a supplement like vitamin D works? And if so, did they even test for deficiencies beforehand to prove that there was a need and that there could be an improvement? Um, did they test for a therapeutic dose afterwards? Did they use a crappy supplement brand? Um, formulation is so important when we're looking at evidence that a supplement might work. So if it's not bioavailable, it, the study is going to show that it doesn't work. If the person wasn't deficient in the nutrient before the study was initiated, it's going to show that that nutrient isn't effective because they weren't in need of that. That wasn't their root cause. So magnesium is a really great example here. In the course I teach, we talk about all these different kinds of magnesium and the different parts of the body that they're effective for. And I don't know how many times I've looked at a research study that says that magnesium is not effective for insert health condition that that type of magnesium does not fix. So, you know, there's types of magnesium that are only really very effective in the gut or that's their primary target. And so then they'll do a study and say, oh, how effective is it for anxiety and depression? Probably not very effective. So look at formulations and ask those kinds of questions of yourself as you're going through the article. How do you feel about their methods? How long did they follow the participants? I love this one because very often they did not follow them very long. They definitely don't often do long-term follow-up. They will do a study and prove that XYZ works or does not work. And that is the end of the story. When we're looking at cohorts of participants, we want to ask ourselves, what are the odds that this group of people had the same root cause? Because if they didn't have the same root cause, a large study is not gonna be very effective. After you review all this, ask yourself how you feel about the article. Do you still trust the source? Do you approve of their methods? Do you see any gaps in their methods? Is there another study that closes these gaps? Are their findings applicable to your patient population? If you find that you go really deep into an article, look at their references and citations. I have often found their claims aren't really held up in those articles, or the study was really done on mice, like I mentioned, or it was a generalization that isn't as applicable to the topic I'm interested in as they might have claimed. This is one reason we need to be able to review our own research. If you want to find an article to prove you're right on pretty much any topic, you can. So people you're listening to and reading online are citing sources. With the skills to evaluate this research, you may find holes in their claims. I often think back to the, I watch a lot of uh, period type movies and shows when I watch television and I 
think about the fact that bloodletting used to be mainstream. And that is such a great example of how research being uh, added into practice changes healthcare over time. I try to keep that in mind, you know, like we're moving forward in healthcare and functional medicine is becoming a little bit more mainstream, but it moves kind of at a snail's pace. And uh, what is accepted in the mainstream currently may not necessarily be <laughs> something that we would take very seriously 100 years from now. Case studies, I want to mention for a second just the value of the N of 1. Initially, in order to validate functional medicine practices, we have to start with case studies. So you will find case studies on one client or one patient and their outcomes, and that cannot be extrapolated to a larger audience by itself. But when we start to have a collection of these and then we can compile this and justify a cohort study, and you can see how this could progress. And on that topic, I wanted to finish with my thoughts on uh, some future thoughts for functional medicine and research. Two thoughts. Um, number one, I wanted to mention genetics. There is so much emerging in the field of genetics and epigenetics and uh, how our food and our genetics play together and our lifestyle. And we talk a lot in functional medicine about how our genes are not our destiny. But there's so much that can inform us into our risks and maybe some factors that we can use to mitigate a potential that we have from our family history. And so I'm really excited that I'm seeing more and more research emerge that is taking this into consideration. And I'm super optimistic that in the next few years and in the coming decades, we're going to see a bigger focus on using cohorts of participants that have the same genetic markers for or a risk for a condition. And then what can we do for that group of people with the same potential root cause and the same potential need for maybe uh, some extra support? The second thing that I wanted to mention is uh, in our last episode, I asked, how long does it take research to be incorporated into practice? And it bothered me. I couldn't think of it off the top of my head. So I looked it up and I found a little bit of an older study that said 17 years very specifically. But then I found newer research that said it takes 10 to 20 years for research to be incorporated into mainstream practice. So today's research would be put into mainstream evidence-based practice guidelines in about 10 or 20 years. And that's assuming it isn't a smaller holistic study that truly heals people because they don't make it into the evidence-based practice guidelines. So I will ask you again, why are we waiting for guidelines mostly mandated by drug companies to dictate our practice? I really encourage you to start evaluating the evidence versus following the guidelines. And until our next episode, be well. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of the Functional Nurse Podcast. If you want to help spread the word about the powerful role nurses can play as true healers using functional medicine practices, consider sharing an episode with a nurse friend or on social media and click the subscribe button to stay informed of newly released episodes. You can also visit and share the links below in the show notes for more information on nursing resources and the Functional Medicine for Nurses course offered through the Integrative Nurse Coach Academy in partnership with the Institute for Functional Medicine.